Hey, what's up guys, and welcome to my PS3 game collection video. For this generation, I mostly collected for Xbox 360, but there were still plenty of things I wanted to play that you could only get on the PS3. That being the case, though, you should consider this to be a companion piece to my 360 collection videos, so if you haven't seen those, you may want to check them out first. There were also many games that had exclusive content on Sony platforms, or purportedly ran better on Sony hardware, so any multi-platform games that you see in this video, that's why. Between my physical and digital only titles, my collection is currently sitting at about 125 games, so we've got a lot of ground to cover. I've split up everything into genres and put chapters down below and in the description in case you're looking for something specific. And with that, let's get started. And what better place to start in the 7th generation than with first person shooters? Thankfully there aren't too many this time around. Ah yes, the Halo Killer. Well, one of the few dozen anyway. Little did they know the only thing that could kill Halo was itself. I haven't played very far in a haze yet, but it's so infamous that I at least wanted to give it a try. So far it plays fairly well, so maybe it'll surprise me. MOH Warfighter was the final nail in the coffin for Medal of Honor. This is one of the multiplats that's supposed to run better on PS3, but I really hope that's not true because Warfighter runs like my console's about to die. Probably skip this one. The original reboot was surprisingly decent, so maybe give that a try. The PS3 limited edition of Medal of Honor 2010 does include a supposed remaster of MOH Frontline, which is one of the best games in the series, but trust me when I say the remaster is nearly unplayable, with a terrible frame rate, busted AI and audio, plus the ADS mechanic they added looks awful and doesn't even work. You definitely want to just stick to the original. We also have the Resistance Trilogy. I haven't dove into these at all yet, but I have a lot of love for World War II style games, especially if they're alternate history, so hopefully they don't disappoint. These are the open world and action adventure games I have for the PS3. When I was a kid, many a playground spat was had over whether the infamous or prototype games were better. Let me know if you have a preference between the two. I finished the first infamous a couple years ago, and despite playing it with a terrible frame rate on a PS3 that was actually dying, I still really loved it. I think the game focuses a bit too much on third person shooting and not enough on all the awesome powers, but the smooth navigation with moral choices, memorable characters, and surprising amount of thematic depth really brought it home for me. I haven't gotten very far into the second one yet, but the change in voice actor was really jarring off the rip. I didn't end up getting the collection for this one because it didn't have Festival of Blood physically, so there's not really any point. By comparison, I've barely touched Prototype. The second game is one of the multiplats that runs a lot better on PS3, so make sure to pick it up here. I'm slowly collecting all the Ratchet & Clank series, but I haven't gotten into any of them yet. Thankfully, you can play just about every mainline game on the PS3 aside from the newer ones. The Godfather game is head and shoulders above most licensed games of the era in terms of quality. The gripping world, family politics, and action from the film are all here in spades, along with some extra backstory to serve as the fans. The melee combat can feel a bit jank at first, but once you get the hang of it, it's a unique system with a fair bit of depth. The PS3 version serves as the definitive edition for the game, as it runs the best and has a bit of added content, but that does come at about twice the price of the 360 print. Here are my PS3 hack and slash games. The 7th generation is when the genre really started to take off, and we're starting with a banger. El Shaddai Ascension of the Metatron is a game set around the Book of Enoch, where you play as the great-grandfather of Noah himself in an effort to stop a cadre of fallen angels from destroying humanity in a great flood. The visuals and music can only be described as angelic, the art itself being done by Sawaki Takesu, one of the lead artists on Devil May Cry and Okami. Although the combat isn't the deepest in the world, it'll still keep you engaged long enough to see the insane plot unfold. This is absolutely one of the PS3's best hidden gems, and it's also a multiplat that runs a lot better on Sony hardware. It's more than worth your time, please check it out. Fairy Tale Fights, unfortunately, is not worth your time. It reminds me a lot of Naughty Bear, trying to sell itself on its edginess alone while suffering in every other department, including Charm Factor. It's a skip. Here we also have another relatively unknown hack and slash, but a truly great one. Heavenly Sword is a game made by one of my favorite studios, Ninja Theory. It combines tight controls and flashy combat with standout characters, a beautiful world, and a heartfelt story. Plus an amazing performance from Andy Serkis as the main villain. This is one of the best games in the entire genre, you absolutely have to play it. Heroes Paradise is an enhanced port of the original Wii masterpiece by Suda51 that fixes a lot of the graphical and performance issues that the original game had. Thankfully you can also use a regular controller if you want, but it does have PS Move support as well, so you can charge your katana the way God intended. The original game also came out on the Switch recently, so there's never been a better time to jump into what I think is one of Grasshopper's best works. Alrighty, here's what you've been waiting for. It's time for the big boy stack, the JRPGs. This is the main reason I decided to get the console in the first place. The PS3 has a treasure trove of underrated and overlooked JRPGs, primarily due to reviewers at the time suddenly deciding they hated the entire genre. Artanelic Okoga is the third in a series of action RPGs by Gust that focus on themes of music and language. Well, when they're not being incredibly horny. 
Yep, like Record of Agorist War, this series is known for having a lot of fan service, so you should know what to expect going in. However, I think it's worth getting past that and the kind of janky combat systems to get to experience the detailed world and unique narrative, plus some of the best OSTs in any JRPG. Cross Edge is a crossover tactical RPG featuring characters from Artinelico, Atelier, Blazing Souls, Darkstalkers, Disgaea, and Spectral Souls. As is usually the case with crossover RPGs, the combat system and the story are not the focus here. The main draw is to see your favorite characters in action. Other than that, this game doesn't have a lot to offer. Eternal Sonata was one of the games I finished last year and ended up loving. The only thing I found a bit disappointing about this game was the narrative, but everything else from the combat system to the aesthetics and music are excellent. The PS3 version also added increased difficulty, which is something the game sorely needed. I would highly recommend giving Eternal Sonata a shot if you never have. I doubt Folklore needs an introduction for most of you, as it's considered to be one of the best JRPGs of the generation. It's an ARPG set in Ireland, and the story is played from two points of view, a girl trying to find her mother whom she thought was dead, and the editor of an occult magazine who gets caught up in a string of murders, all set to the backdrop of Irish mythology. I can firmly say it's one of the most unique and high-quality JRPGs, or just games in general, that you're likely to find this gen. Lost Dimension was for a long time one of the most expensive games on the console, but thankfully it's slowly been coming down, but it's still my most expensive game on the PS3. This is more or less what would happen if you combined a TRPG with Danganronpa. The game takes place in five stages, and when you're not fighting, you're trying to figure out who among us... Um, among you? Among y'all? You're trying to figure who amongst these guys is a traitor and needs to be taught some respect. Something that actually changes on subsequent playthroughs. It's a combo that works really well, retaining the charm and mystique of its inspiration while also having a fleshed out gameplay loop, something that Danganronpa sorely lacked. I haven't played any of the Rune Factory series yet, but this seemed to be the place to jump in because holy crap, just look at the combat. Ditto for Star Ocean. I know this game isn't very well liked by fans of the series, but I still want to make up my own mind about it. The Zillia duology and Grace's F are usually considered some of the best Tales games ever, and some of the best JRPGs of the generation. Even if Zillia's combat might take a bit of getting used to, there's still must plays. Tears to Tiara 2 is the first time the series of TRPG slash visual novel hybrids have come westward. Granted, the visuals aren't much to look at, but they hide a well-written story and solid combat system. It's worth checking out, I think. The Guided Fate Paradox and its sequel, The Awakened Fatal Tomatum, are both fairly basic roguelike dungeon crawlers. Pretty much their only claim to fame are that they share a universe with Disgaea and have some of the actresses from Muse voicing the main characters. Other than that, they're not considered to be very good games. Time and Eternity tries something really interesting with its 3D rendered backgrounds and 2D animated character sprites, which give the game a really lively and unique feel. Unfortunately, it also happens to be one of, if not the worst, JRPG on the console. I would really love to see this style of visuals with a higher budget and in a better game, but it looks like Time and Eternity is going to have the legacy of a failed experiment and nothing more. Trinity Souls of Zillol is a game I got based off of Eric Landon's recommendation, and I think he hit the nail on the head here. It's a little short, and the ARPG combat can definitely get pretty tough, even Soulsian. But you also have a dark fantasy story filled with interesting characters and adult themes that ends up being a real nail-biter. It's definitely a sleeper hit. Next we have the adventure section, starting off with two games from Quantic Dream, Beyond Two Souls and Heavy Rain. This is the same developer that more recently made Detroit Become Human, and they're one of the few studios keeping the adventure genre alive. These games, along with their creator David Cage, are nothing if not divisive, though. Personally, I'm conflicted. Does Cage deserve a lot of the hate he gets? Sure, but not all of it. I think people take these games way too seriously for their own good, and can't enjoy them for the mostly mindless romps that they're supposed to be. Along with the fact that a lot of the criticism is from supposed hardcore gamers, also known as crybabies, complaining that there's not enough gameplay. Though hopefully the community has grown up a bit since his last release. If you're not familiar with Quantic Dream's style of games, you control the characters mostly through choices and QTEs, and the narrative can change drastically depending on how things play out. It's also safe to say that each game has probably been the best looking thing on consoles when they came out. I'm honestly pretty hyped for Star Wars Eclipse, since David is way better than any of the writers Disney has working on Star Wars. Outside of Tony Gilroy, of course. Hopefully that turns out well. I have the original releases of these games because, as is often the case with remasters from 7th to 8th gen, they were completely destroyed. Two Souls less so, but it still has issues. Heavy Rain just looks terrible though. Worse lighting and shadows, even lesser textures in a lot of cases. Plus it didn't even include the DLC. Always do your research when it comes to getting a 7th gen remaster, because it's about 50-50 whether they screwed it up or not. I haven't played the Little Big Planet series at all and don't really know anything about them, so I'll have to talk about them at a later date. How can you describe Overlord other than it's basically evil Pikmin? You have a horde of goblins at your command and go around wreaking as much havoc as you can. The gameplay isn't as refined as Pikmin, but I really love the rare game that actually encourages you to be the bad guy. It's a nice change of pace. 
Puppeteer is thankfully getting a lot more eyes on it in recent years, as it's one of the best hidden gems on the console. You control Kutaro, a puppet who's lost his mind, or at least his head, and has to collect various heads and powers to free his soul and save his world's ruler. The gameplay and art style both combine to create an experience you can't find elsewhere. Amazingly, our third-person shooter category isn't actually that large this time around. Bionic Commando and Earth Defense Force Insect Armageddon are both multiplats that run better on the PS3, so I decided to pick them up over here. Bionic Commando is a reboot of the series that goes all the way back to the NES. The originals were fairly beloved, though they sold quite poorly, and aside from the grappling hook, the 2009 game dropped most everything from its predecessors. It was a cool novelty back in the day when there weren't many other games that had such fluid controls, but nowadays it's probably not worth revisiting. If you've never heard of the EDF series, they're just co-op monster horde shooters, nothing more, nothing less. Not a lot of narrative or gameplay depth, but if you're looking for some cheesy fun with a buddy, then they're a good time. Layer was one of the most high profile and also one of the most infamous early releases on the PS3. There was a lot of hype behind this game for obvious reasons because, I mean, well, look at it. But it launched in a terrible state with nigh unusable 6 axis controls and poor performance. It's since been patched a lot and I've heard it's a lot better now, but nothing could save this game's reputation. I haven't gotten around to it yet, so let me know if you've played it recently and what you thought of it. Regrettably, Layer's poor performance would see to the shuttering of Factor 5, the same studio that brought us the brilliant Rogue Squadron games. I covered MGS4 in more detail in my 2022 ranking video, <laughs> link in the description, but personally I think it's one of the more underrated Metal Gears, especially with how experimental it gets. It's certainly not for everyone, but I still think that you should check it out if you're a hardcore fan of the series like me. I was expecting Sorcery to be a complete piece of crap when I booted it up. It's a game where you play as a wizard and flick around the PlayStation Move to shoot magic out of your wand. Quiet back there. Surprisingly, the controls actually work really well though, I was blown away. I'm excited to get further into it. Dead Souls is a zombie spin-off of the Like a Dragon series that plays kind of like a cross between Dead Rising and House of the Dead. It's one of the more expensive games on the console, and I don't see Sega porting it anytime soon, so I'd pick it up sooner rather than later if you're interested. This is another one of the biggest reasons to get a PS3, the compilations. Compilation as always meaning anything with two or more games on the disc. You saw a lot of great game collections on the PS3, primarily due to it being the first console to use Blu-rays, meaning that there was suddenly a lot of extra space on the disc for goodies. Not every compilation is worth getting, though. You want to be careful. Most people know about the infamously terrible Silent Hill HD collection, but I've heard only bad things about the Splinter Cell, Tomb Raider, and Prince of Persia collections as well. Everything else is mostly on point, though. The Far Cry comp on PS3 is the only way to get Far Cry 3 Blood Dragon physically. They did not put it on the disc in the 360 version. Thanks to MJR for that info. I have both the God of War collection and the Origins collection, because by including God of War 3 in the God of War saga, they didn't have enough space left for the PSP games, so Chains of Olympus and Ghost of Sparta are just download codes in that edition. They're on the disc in the Origins collection, though. It pains me to say, but Eco still hasn't seen another re-release, aside from this collection, which remains the best way to play it. I practically haven't stopped thinking about it after playing it last year. It's stuck with me more than almost any other game. If you've never played Eco, I really can't recommend it enough, and thankfully due to Shadow of the Colossus receiving a remake, this collection is still very cheap. I played the Killzone trilogy for the first time a couple years ago, and after really enjoying the first game and being excited for where the next two would go, 2 and 3 were extreme disappointments. I haven't played Shadowfall or the PSP games yet, so hopefully my opinion of the series improves in the future, but now that Gorilla has hit it big time with Horizon, it's unlikely we'll ever see another entry in the series. The MGS Legacy Collection is still the best way to play through the entire Metal Gear series. It has every canonical game in the saga, aside from Ground Zeroes plus the Phantom Pain. You do need to get a copy that still has the voucher code in it, as MGS1 and VR missions are only digital. Hopefully the Master Collection that's releasing in a few days will make this edition irrelevant, but as of now, with Konami's track record, I'm not convinced. These are three of my big blind spots in gaming. I haven't played any Ratchet & Clank, Sly Cooper, or Tales yet. I'm looking to start Tales of Fantasia sometime this year if I can find a PSP copy, though. Time Crisis Raising Storm contains the previously released Time Crisis 4, along with two new games, Raising Storm and Dead Storm Pirates. You can use a controller, but it also has support for the PlayStation Move and the GunCon 3, named as such because it only works with these three games. It's also really hard to find and pretty expensive, but apparently it's a solid piece of hardware as far as non-traditional light guns go. This is easily my favorite light gun series, and I can't wait to play this one once I finally get my hands on the GunCon 3. By the way, everyone watching this, please go tweet at Namco telling them to release Time Crisis 5 on consoles. I'll pay you back in, um, uh, uh gratitude crystals, I guess. Thanks, guys. But rounding it out, White Knight Chronicles is a series of two JRPGs that flew under the radar, but they're some of the better games in the genre on PS3, at least when taken as a duology. They were made by Level 5, the same developers as Dark Cloud, Rogue Galaxy, and Nino Kuni. They won't blow your mind or anything, but they're at least worth a look. 
The second game includes a light remaster of the entire first game along with it, so that's why it's here. We finally have enough fighting games for them to have their own category. Granted, I'm a very casual fighting game fan, so take what I have to say with a grain of salt. These first two are games from Examu, who have a brilliant track record but are strangely underappreciated. Aquapaza is a crossover fighting game featuring characters from Aquaplus's back catalog of games, including Tears to Tiara, Two Heart, Kizuato, Comic Party, White Album, and of course, Uta Wadadumano. I just saw the original Uta anime earlier this year, so this was something I was really hyped for, and even though the mechanics aren't easy to pick up at first, once you put some time into it, it plays fantastically. Granted, if you're not a visual novel connoisseur, then this might not hold much appeal for you, but for me, a game like this is basically a dream come true. I wish we saw a lot more things like it. Arcane Heart 3 is probably going to be more recognizable to Western audiences though, as this is Examu's flagship IP. Arcane Heart is basically Lolly Fight Simulator. Boss, you can't say that! Why? What do you mean? You just can't, sir. The lawyers are going to be breathing down my necks! Okay, fine. I'll take it out. Jeez. Anyway, Arcane Heart has a fast pace, complex systems, huge cast, and gorgeous animation. This game is basically everything I could ask for in a 2D fighter. Just be aware of what you're getting into, but I think the fighting game crowd is a bit more used to um, certain character designs. PlayStation All-Stars is what happens when you want to make one of them their uh, Smush Brothers, but you have no idea what you're doing. I don't know how someone even comes up with the idea of having to use a super to kill enemies, that's just so stupid. Plus the cast is not what it should be. You know you're scraping the bottom of the barrel when you're using two versions of Cole McGrath, or a character from Starhawk, a game people care about so little that I didn't even mention it earlier. But there's also things like the Big Daddy, like Bioshock isn't even a Sony franchise. Hell, Bioshock 1 was a 360 timed exclusive. Plus they chose the Dante from the reboot and most people's least favorite Metal Gear character. Like, where's Crash, Klonoa, Spyro, Mr. Mosquito, Resident Evil, Siphon Filter, Tomb Raider, Oddworld, Ark the Lad, Eco or Shadow of the Colossus, Final Fantasy, Castlevania, Legacy of Cain, Sui Coden? Hell, I'd take cool borders at this point. There are innumerable franchises Sony could pull from, but the cast is mostly comprised of PS3 characters, which just screams bare minimum. Such a disappointment. A game like this should be a celebration of your entire history, but they clearly just didn't care about it. Okay, sorry, rant over. As I've said previously, you can now no longer purchase the DLC for Soul Calibur 4, so you need each version of the game to play as Darth Vader or Yoda, and Galen Merrick is just inaccessible now. Hopefully now that EA has lost exclusivity, we can finally get someone to make a decent Star Wars game. Anyone? Please? Art system? Are you busy? I don't think it's a controversial statement to say that Street Fighter Cross Tekken should have been the greatest fighting game of all time. A crossover game between the two greatest fighting game series? Sign me up, dude. So of course, they fucked it up. Horrific microtransactions, including a lot of on-disc DLC, you know, back when people used to get mad about being robbed, combined with gameplay that was fundamentally broken on launch made this game fade into obscurity before it could even get off the ground. It's since been patched to fix a lot of its issues, but most people still won't even touch it. Sure, Namco should have been more hands-on with the development, but there's just no reason for Capcom to screw up a fighting game this bad. Lastly, we have Tekken Hybrid, which is a remaster of Tag Tournament 1 with a demo of Tag 2, and also has the Tekken Blood Vengeance movie, which is frankly not very good, but it's still the definitive version of one of the best fighting games ever. I have a vast array of imports that I plan on getting for the PS3, but for now, this is it. As most people know by now, the PS3 has no region locking for games, so feel free to import to your heart's content. Rain is a game I played earlier this year in my quest to play every eco-like that I can find. It wasn't released physically in English outside of the absurdly expensive and rare Chinese and Korean versions. However, this is the version to get, even and especially if you don't speak Japanese, because as I'll detail in my 2023 ranking video, I think the game is a much better overall experience without the narration which this version actually gives you the option to fully turn off. I enjoyed Rain so much that it's the game I chose to introduce my mom to video games, and so far she's loved it. We're on the final chapter as I write this. Quest for Booty is more or less an expansion for Tools of Destruction, as it's a much shorter adventure that continues where that game left off. It was included as a download code with Into the Nexus, but it was also released physically in PAL regions. And now it's time for this video's absurdly obscure entry! Short piece, Adanko Skigime's Longest Day was actually developed by Grasshopper, and in addition to the game, it has four tie-in anime short films. The game itself is something of a mix between an action platformer and endless runner. I haven't gotten very far into it yet, but as far as uniqueness goes, this one is definitely up there. Siren is also a fairly recondite series, though it's been getting a lot more attention in recent years. This is the final entry in the horror trilogy, but acts as a reimagining of the first game with a slightly rearranged story and better gameplay. In Siren, you sight-jack in enemies using their line of sight to try and hide from them. 
This is one of the only good examples of a pure horror game in the entire generation, and I'd recommend it just for that. But it's also the pinnacle of one of the most truly unnerving horror series ever. I absolutely love these games, and if you've never tried them, this is a great place to start. That said, it was only released in English physically in PAL territories, and it's definitely getting up there in price. Our last category is the miscellaneous games that I didn't have enough of to make their own category for. Primarily shooters, horror, and racing. Child of Eden is a game that almost no one has heard of, and that's a real shame because this is one of the most beautifully trippy games I've ever played. It's a spiritual successor to Rez, made by the same creator, but they really broke the knob off on this one. It's still a rail shooter, but the amazing visuals are cranked up to 11. A friend of mine said it's about as close to a religious experience as you can have with video games, and I'm kind of inclined to agree. I've played both versions of Child of Eden on the Kinect and the PS Move, and unsurprisingly the Move works a lot better, so I kept this one. You can also just play with a controller, though. Either way, this game is dirt cheap, but it's one of the most extraordinary games on the console. You have to give it a try. I got Dead Space 2 on PS3 because it runs better and has the spin-off rail shooter Extraction added to the disc. And here we have Deadly Premonition, still the most polarizing horror game ever made, mainly due to IGN's awful takes, in case you thought IGN being dumb was a newer development. If you've somehow never heard of it, Deadly Premonition combines the uncanny, surrealist tone from David Lynch's works, in particular Twin Peaks, with the open-world meandering of Shenmue to create an experience all its own. Granted, I don't think it'll appeal to the modern crowd as much now that open-world fatigue is fully set in, but it's still a game that everyone should play at least once. The director's cut added better controls, performance, and PS Move compatibility, which can only make the game more hilarious, plus some extra story tidbits. Full Auto 2 is oddly a PS3 exclusive sequel to the first Full Auto, which was a 360 exclusive. I haven't put too much time into them yet, but so far they're just pure chaos. So much so that it's hard to even tell what's going on. I think we see here why it's a mistake to give you weapons permanently in a racing game. As of now, they're definitely not my favorite combat racing games. House of the Dead Overkill is a spin-off of the main series that features a more grindhouse aesthetic along with a 70s inspired soundtrack. This game was also turned into a sequel to Typing of the Dead on PC, which is a version of House of the Dead where you have a keyboard instead of a light gun and have to type correctly in order to kill monsters. It's a pretty good entry into the genre for those who aren't familiar with light gun games, as the difficulty remains quite low throughout, but it's still a worthwhile entry. Despite being a launch title for the PS3, Ridge Racer 7 is the last truly great console entry to the series. Aside from looking and playing beautifully, this series used to be a great benchmark for new hardware, but Namco has slowly let it fade into obscurity with a lot of their other beloved franchises. Time crisis. The shoot is a rail shooter that requires the PS move, and it's… fine. The controls work about as well as you can expect, but the visual style is pretty terrible. I do enjoy the focus on accuracy rather than spamming as many bullets downrange as possible, though. Last but not least is Under Defeat, the first shoot 'em up from G-Rev. This game is beloved by shmup fans, even getting an honorable mention among the best shmups of all time in last year's lists, but I haven't really gotten along with it so far. The controls are too sluggish for my taste, and the visual style is muddied and makes it difficult to see what's happening a lot of the time. Which granted is exacerbated by my color blindness, but still, I don't know if I've ever struggled to see attacks this much in any shmup. I need to put more time into it, but frankly it's amazing to see how much they improved going from this game to Strania. I want to give a brief mention to the digital-only games I have as well, so let's do a lightning round, shall we? Battle Princess of Arcadius is a JRPG that's supposed to have a pretty good story, but so far I can't even figure out how the combat system works, and I keep getting dummied by the first boss. Big Sky Infinity is a procedurally generated twin-stick shmup. It sucks. Last Factor was a cool score attack twin-stick, but then they introduced terrible motion controls, and I haven't played it since. I finished Everyday Shooter this year, so I'll talk about that in the ranking video. Explode Demon is one of the rare games that was so bad I didn't even force myself to finish it. House of the Dead 4 never got a physical release, so you can only get it here, but personally it's my favorite game in the main series. Hydrophobia Prophecy is the updated re-release of the arcade horror game from the 360, but it actually got worse reviews, so I wanted to try both versions and see which one I like more. If you like dungeon crawlers that are incredibly overbearing and annoying, Legazista is for you. Linker in Shadows isn't a game, more of an interactive art piece. It's only about 5 minutes long and there wasn't any part of it that caught my eye. Luftrausers is a score attack shmup where you use your thrust to move and to kill enemies. Not what I expected at all, don't really care for it. Master Reboot is another bad first person adventure game with horror elements and a vague, unsatisfying plot. It throws a lot of stuff at the wall and none of it really sticks. Reminds me a lot of Soul Axiom actually. Hey, wouldn't you know it, same dev. Can I pick him or what? I swear I didn't know that before writing this. Within 30 seconds of booting up Mountain Crime Acquittal, you know what's up. It's a seek and find hidden object adventure game that was probably made on a budget of about $80. They're fun with a friend while drunk, but otherwise hard avoid. Nelson Tethers is a puzzle game from Telltale. Uh, 
uh, that's that's all I got. I haven't played it much yet. Nucleus is another generic twin stick. It looks and plays pretty terrible so far. Papo and Yo, despite a couple issues, was one of my favorite games from last year. Definitely check it out. Payday the Heist. It's Payday, but the first one. It plays about the same. Proteus is a walking simulator that generates a random world for you to explore, and, well, that's about it. It's, um, it's nice. I also finished Red Baron Arcade this year, so once again, watch the ranking video. Red Johnson's Chronicles is an adventure puzzler that got really low reviews, so hopefully it provides some cheesy goodness. Alright, hold up for a sec. Retrograde is actually really dope. It's a rhythm game that takes on the accoutrements of a shoot 'em up except you play in reverse. It's a really cool idea and plays quite well. I can't wait to put more time into it. Soldner X has the visuals of a decent modern shmup, but the gameplay is outright terrible. Of all the amazing shmups in the 7th generation, it would be a shame to play this instead. Strong Bad is another telltale point and click. I like the art style, but the story and humor didn't keep me engaged for very long. Tales from Space about a blob. It's a game where you're a blob and you get bigger. What else can I say? Tori Emaki is an interactive emakimono. Similar to Linger in Shadows, there's no real gameplay, just flying around and looking at stuff. It's very relaxing. Vessel is a physics-based puzzle game with steampunk aesthetics that primarily uses liquid as its core element. This one surprised me. It's a lot of fun and quite long, actually, especially for an arcade game. And time. Was that too fast or not fast enough? I don't know, but that's the end of the video. I've only had the PS3 for going on four years now, so I'm still fairly new to it, and despite having my qualms about the hardware, there are so many amazing games on it. I really want to dive further into its library in the coming years. Speaking of, my collection aside from the imports is nearly done. The only games that I have left that I want to get are the 12 on screen. Let me know if there's anything you think I'm missing out on, I'd love to hear any recommendations you have. If you're interested in collecting for the PS3, I'd say that now is basically last call for the console. Most people haven't started collecting for the PS3 yet, but the games are already getting really pricey. For context, an average PS3 game will cost you the same right now as it did in May of 2011, back when the console was still modern. And a lot of the more desirable games are already breaking into the triple digits. You absolutely need to collect for this console as soon as possible if you plan to do so. Also, if you have any questions about collecting for the PS3, then put them down in the comments and I'd be happy to help you out. And with that, thank you guys for watching and have a splendid day.